Hello, I want to welcome everybody to this Code Labs Tech Talk. I'm super excited that John from RTS Labs could come today to talk about data engineering. Hello, um, my name is John Ramirez, and as was stated, I am a data engineer and data architect um, at RTS Labs. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about data engineering, um, a little bit of history about data, um, and some of the modern tools and techniques that companies use to um, really uh, process tons and tons of data on a daily basis. Um, I will ask that your questions be left to the end. Um, and after those questions, um, I will be um, showing a little demo of a uh, technology that we at RTS have used for clients um, called Prefect. It's a workflow engine, and I think you'll be um, very interested in what it has to offer. Um, so let me go ahead and get this started. All right. So the name of this uh, presentation I'm going to give is the Invisible Code: Data Engineering in 2020. Um, brief agenda: We're going to do introductions. Um, we're going to talk about data and a little bit of the history, and then we're going to talk about data engineering in uh, in 2020. As I said, we'll have a Q and A at the at the end, and then a brief demo. Um, so, a little bit about my background. Um, I've been with RTS Labs for about three years, uh, building custom data solutions for clients. Um, RTS Labs uh, is uh, a consulting firm, so typically clients come to, come to us with issues that we try to solve for them. And again, I work in the data solutions team. I have seven years of, of experience working with data and data infrastructure. Um, a little bit of a side note, I did not actually go to school for computer engineering. I sort of um, built my way into it. Uh, my first, I went to school for um, accounting um, and finance. And uh, here I am seven years later. Um, I'm proficient in Python SQL, um, Postgres, MySQL, and other cloud technologies. So let's talk about what I mean by the invisible code. Really what the invisible code is alluding to um, is basically something that's unseen. It's a play on the term called the invisible hand. Um, this term was coined by an economist to basically be a metaphor for unforeseen forces driving the economy. And basically what it was meant to show was that we as individuals make decisions on a daily basis that will benefit our self self interests and basically if you were to allow these forces to um, move around at their own leisure then it will kind of create an equilibrium but it was typically an unforeseen force well if you think about our modern way of life data is now the unforeseen force for many companies. If you think of Apple, if you think of Google, if you think of um, any large corporation, they accumulate tons and tons of data, millions and trillions of rows of data every, every day, every month, every year. But in order for them to actually make any sense of the data that they collect, they need a way to process the information. So data engineering really involves preparing the data for analytical and operational use, right? It's sort of like a giant well. Until you actually you know, start um, drawing from the well, you don't really have the benefits. It kind of just sits there. So it really allows the end users to gain insight into complex questions and also the metrics um, surrounding it, right? And data engineering is not a new concept, but it's actually been accelerated into a prominent position because of the um, uh, gains in technology that we have accumulated over the last 50 years. So if you wanna talk about the history of data, you have to really go back before 1970. Before 1970, 
everything was collected on paper. It was a very manual process to, uh, you know, collect the information, calculate the information. It liter literally took manpower. You needed a, a lot of people to do it. Um, and computers were horribly expensive, not very efficient, and uh, required a lot of money. So it w there wasn't accessible to the general public. It was only accessible to really, really big um, corporations and government entities. You move past the 1970s up until about 1990, you start to get a more systematic approach. There's uh, the introduction of data warehouses and databases, the difference being that a data warehouse is sort of a central location for all data, whereas databases can just be used for a single purpose. You also have monolithic systems where basically companies will send, will sell you the, uh, the whole end-to-end -end solution in one big product. Um, and you also have data specialists, people who are specializing in basically taking this information from sources um, and starting to build these repositories so that people can actually use the information um, to make decisions within, within these companies. And then really from 1990 to 2010, you sort of get, uh, see the evolutionary expansion of data. You get more diverse data sources. You know, no longer is it just a database and maybe some electronic files, right? You start to see, um, you know, APIs become more prevalent as a way for people to hook in and access information. You have the intro of cloud technologies, very, very primitive, but they're starting to get traction. And also you see lower compute costs. A lot of barriers to entry during this time was that, you know, or before 1990 was that computers were still very expensive. Within the 20 year period of 1990 to 2010, the cost of computing and computers shrinks dramatically and you have more accessibility to everyone else and you have more um, companies that are mid-sized and smaller being able to take advantage of this computing technology. And then from 2010 to today, you've had an enormous shift. There, there is the great cloud migration going on right now. Companies that were have invested heavily in like physical servers and physical uh, space are now moving to the cloud in order to reduce costs, re um, to reduce costs from, from computing, but also reduce costs based on manpower and space. There's this uh, constant war of open source technologies versus proprietary technologies. You know, during, starting in 2010, you really, open source really becomes not just a trend, but a way for both developers um, and companies to really um, embrace, embrace new technologies that were sort of cut off from them because of the high costs. And then you also have this trend from actually, you know, using what I would call GUID, GUI applications, click, click and drag um, in order to process everything to a more code based um, data processing model because of the gains that you have with um, DevOps and actually maintaining code people find a lot easier than managing these giant applications to do clicks and drags and and moving in that sort of direction. So that's where we're at right now. You have, you know, lo a lot of cloud technology. You have this battle between open source and proprietary and everything is starting to move in into code. And really that opens up the question as to what do I do as a data engineer in order to um, really um, help my clients? Well, basically what I do is four things. I, I understand the needs and issues of clients. You know, these needs can either be very simple or very complicated. 
the more most complicated case that I've seen is basically a migration. Clients come to us and say, we have these old technologies, we're running on these old um, internal servers, we want to move everything to cloud and we really want to embrace the cloud, the, the cloud as our new platform. Well, as a data engineer, that means that I need to really do a lot of research into what tools are, are available for clients in, in a new cloud platform. I need to say which platform, you know, because there's AWS, um, there's Azure, there's Google Cloud. There are so many different uh, platforms out there and open source technologies that you really, I really need to know which technology would be best for the client. I need to present solutions. You know, there's more than one one way to um, more than one way to do things, right? And you need to be able to um, present different options to clients and figure out different ways to process the information because clients may be limited in terms of their budget. The clients may be limited in terms of what um, what they actually can do. Um, and so once we really get that firm setting, we go, we build, we test and modify. Um, and that's that's really what I do do on a daily basis. It's a lot different from your typical software engineer, um, either uh, your your data science scientist. I have to be sort of a jack of all trades. I have to understand cloud technology. I need to understand how to program um, data operations in the best way. I need to have a of a good understanding of databases and I have to have a good understanding of other technologies of uh, to to really satisfy the client so if you look at sort of the Venn diagram you can see you know for data engineers a lot of it is just straight development of web applications right you need to know HTML jQuery .NET web services um, on the data data scientist side, um, you know, you need to have more of a theoretical um, sense with you know algorithms, statistical model, modeling, uh, research and analytics. Right, that's a that's a very um, I would say academic sort of role, and you can see sort of in the middle, data engineers have to have a combination of both. Right, as a data engineer, I need to know how to build data warehouses. I need to know how to put data together from multiple sources in order for companies to make sense of it. I need to know how to use a command line um, to access servers. I need to know, uh, you know, uh, business intelligence, which is basically a fancy way of saying, you know, uh, how can companies use the, the data that we're sort of collecting in order to make everything work well. So as a data engineer, you really need to have exposure to a lot of technologies and not necessarily need to focus on that main on one major technology. Because um, right now, there are so many different products that are coming onto the market. There are so many new techniques that are being introduced to clients that you really can't sort of stay still in your box. You just need to be able to push forward um, and, uh, and move with the flow. Um, so really, you know, that core uh, concept of being able to do cloud technology, coding, um, workflow design is all sort of part part of the job. Um, so at, at RTS ourselves, we use, you know, we are always up to date on the modern, modern technologies. You know, uh, Salesforce is a big, is a big part, part of, you know, a, a company's uh, uh, tool, toolkit nowadays. It seems like everyone is using Salesforce. Um, and for me, what is very important about these modern technologies is not just you know how clients interact with it it's how 
is the data generated from, from these modern technologies, right? Salesforce has their own API. I need to know how to interact with that API. Now, I may not know, you know, off the top of my head, the best way to, to interact with it, but I know enough um, to understand that, you know, they have, have this API, I can query the API in, this, in these various ways, and I can get the information out, out of Salesforce. How I do that is really determined by what technologies are available, how the clients work with it, um, and what they really need. So as a data engineer, you're constantly looking for ways um, to really integrate technology with the client needs and with how to work, work, with, work with the technology. Um, right now, you know, there's a big competition going on between AWS, AWS Amazon Web Services, um, and Azure. They are, um, you know, competing against each other for, um, for, uh, for clients. Um, and right now, I would say that, you know, a majority of the, the work that's coming to RTS and, form, and requires data engineering nearing as part of, of the workflow. Um, you know, it's either coming through Azure or Microsoft Web Services um, as the main platform. You know, a lot of companies right now are very uh, reluctant to invest heavily in their own technology um, and passing, passing the buck off, of, off to these cloud platforms has been a real um, shift for them. And so they may not know which which tools and services are available on those platforms. And so for me as a data engineer, I really need to be up to the task of doing that um, and to know how to move huge amounts of data if required, or even, and this is most important, um, even the smaller pieces of information. Because while the big data, as it's termed, sort of the cool kid on the block, most companies really just want reliable ways of processing the smaller pieces of information because it's critical to their business. Uh, and, you know, processing the petabytes and terabytes of data are, are important as well. But it's often overlooked that, you know, you have to have reliable ways to not just process the big data, but also the smaller data. Um, and so I look at these technologies um, to see how best I can accommodate both the big data and the small data. Um, so here's a basic example of a project. Um, this is not um, specific to any one client that I've worked with. Um, this is uh, taken directly from the, from the uh, Microsoft Azure website. Um, they provide sort of uh, uh, architectural designs um, that are open to the public um, to say, you know, you, if you need to do a data warehouse project, which this shows, um, you know, you can use these technologies. So just to sort of go through it to say, you know, these, you know, you have to be familiar with these technologies. I'm just going to go, go through it. So in the first place, you have your structured and unstructured data, you know, unstructured being in sort of a JSON format. Well, me as a data engineer, I need to understand that I need to ingest that data, take it from the source, put it into storage, and I need to know how to prep and process that data for either analytical use, machine learning use, um, and, and or, um, you know, end user consumption, right? So uh, for, for me, you know, you're talking about working with file systems. You need to know how to um, process JSON data. You need to know how to work with Azure Data Factory. You need to know how to work with the storage service. So you can see as you're moving through you know, there's a lot of different services that, you know, aren't necessarily strictly code based, but you need to have the knowledge about how they all interact, 
what I can tell you, for example, is that um, Azure Databricks is, is a service um, where you can process a, a ton of ton of information um, using the um, a, a Apache Spark framework. And that's used to process tons and tons of information. And that is, that is code base, right? I can build a code, uh, a code base to process the data, but I need to know um, the endpoints. I need to know um, the client's desires. So it's not just, again, and, and I'll state this again, it's not just understanding, you know, programming. It's understanding um, what clients really need um, in order to be successful in doing this project. Um, and uh, if you have more questions about this particular workflow, again, at the end, we'll talk about that, but I'll be happy to answer any questions about um, the workflows or, or anything else like that. Um, so we're coming up at the end of, of, end of my presentation, um, but I have a few things that you would want to know um, for 2020. So the big thing is that there are, you know, several main languages that are being used right now in order to process data. Um, one of the big ones is Python. Um, you know, Python, you know, gets a lot of flack for, um, you know, not being a compiled language and not being as performant. But basically, Python, um, at least I find it to be a great glue language. It can um, to basically bridge multiple technologies um, in a way that is both efficient in terms of getting things um, up and running and also to pass on to other individuals. Um, Java and slash Scala, you know, those are more compiled languages. They're very good um, at the big data processing. You know, if you need to process a petabyte of data, you're not going to really write it in Python, you will want to write it in either Java or Scala um, for it to be performant on a, on a big scale. Um, and then the new entry, uh, new entry, entry uh, into the list is really the Go, Go language um, created by Google. Um, this one is also a compi compiled language, um, but it's starting to be used in other um, frameworks as an, a as an API um, uh, uh, API layer for for other for other frameworks, and also if you look look at Go at the Go language itself, it does uh, you are able to process you know um, uh, CSV files, XML files, and other files, um, and you know it's starting to become a good way to uh, process that that information. So I would recommend that if you're interested in data engineering and want to understand more um, or to start programming, I would say, you know, really Python is would be the great best place to start. And if you need to specialize in moving um, bigger data or 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 work with different um, data types, you know, Java and Scala and GoLang would be the next, sort of the next next pieces. Um, some key technologies that are coming up or that have come up and will continue to be uh, big within within data engineering um, is the cloud data warehouse. Um, this is basically you know a, a central repository to store all of your all of your information. Um, and basically, client, uh, uh, basically, companies are taking advantage of the fact that um, you know they can basically now use these products such as Snowflake um, or Redshift on AWS to store massive amounts of data and run queries against against it um, instead of hosting that on their on a physical server. Um, and so that is just going to continue to get better. There's going to be more products out there. Um, and so data warehousing is not going to die. It's just going to be reborn into something different um, for these um, for companies. Um, data streaming is becoming a, a big, big chunk of, of the data, uh, data, uh, uh, in data sphere, if you will. Um, you know, 
collecting um, geolocations for um, uh, from your cell phones, um, getting uh, getting updates uh, from uh, from driverless cars. Um, if you think of Uber, where you know you get your location and then you're tracking the car coming through, all of that information is is collected somewhere, and companies are processing that that data stream either after the fact or as it's coming in to make use of it to make their products better for for us and for them um, another big one is distributed computing this is the idea that you're not just running a single pro one process on a single server you are um, splitting that 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 job out across multiple servers so that it can um, basically um, take advantage of a bigger set of um, a bigger re resource pool. Um, and so frameworks like Apache Spark, Dask, um, basically um, have the ability to spin up a cluster of a thousand servers um, and process, you know, a terabyte, terabyte of data with relative ease. Um, and so distributed computing is getting, uh, is getting better and better and better. Um, and that framework is really essential for bigger, um, uh, for bigger uh, workloads. Um, and finally, uh, this one, this last one is something that I'm very passionate about, data orchestration. Um, so back 20 years ago when you had these monolithic systems they did everything they they extracted the data they processed the data they loaded the data into your your final endpoint they handled errors they handled um, notifications and all of that fun stuff that goes from point a to point b well in the cloud <laughs> all of those services are separate and they have to interact with each other in some way. Um, and data orchestration is a new way of thinking of basically putting those all of those um, services together into one uh, under one umbrella, one uh, service that will handle everything. Um, so th that is something that's that's new um, because because again you have a, a diverse array of tools that do similar things that don't necessarily integrate well with other services. So you sort of need the glue in the middle to make sure that everything is being handled appropriately. And that's what data orchestration um, is about. Um, and finally, uh, just some popular frameworks that I've sort of mentioned. Um, Apache Spark um, is, is a big one. Um, for distributed computing and uh, working uh, with data, Dask is sort is uh, uh, is the uh, is sort of a, a counterpart to Apache Spark. It's a different library um, that's written completely in Python. Um, and uh, the other one is Pandas, which is um, basically a data framework library um, that's really popular with data scientists and data engineers in order to sort of um, process data in code. Um, and finally, some popular platforms, um, Data Snowflake, or sorry, I meant uh, just regular Snowflake. Um, that's a cloud warehouse um, technology and service um, that that's solely what they do. You put your data in there and you're able to run queries against it um, in a very uh, performant environment. Um, Databricks um, is a platform that uh, allows you to process uh, huge amounts of data um, using the Spark Apache Spark framework. Um, and finally, Apache Airflow um, is a data orchestration tool that is really pop popular now um, has, and has a huge following um, that will allow you to interact with, with multiple services, both on the cloud and locally. Um, so I'm going to open up to questions. I saw that there's already a few questions um, there. 
um, uh, in the Q and A. So I'm going to um, uh, open it up. Or I'll, I'm going to stop sharing for a moment, and I'm going to um, uh, answer these questions. So first one for the anonymous. It's uh, the question is hi with the advances in deep learning and AI and mass automation, is there a possibility that there won't be a high demand for data engineers and scientists uh, for the next five to 10 years? Um, that is a very, very good question. So here's the thing about, um, about uh, data engineer AI and, and automation. Um, machines, can't build themselves, right? You have to have um, a data science, you need someone to build it and to, to maintain, maintain the pipeline, if you will. Um, and it, I, I would say that like deep learning and AI is sort of like a, a, is, is a fuzzy thing because your assumption is is that a machine can actually go into a data set and actually find find relationships machines aren't that smart you need people to actually a get the data into a format um, that is actually useful for for use and then you need to actually apply an algorithm to the data set in order to find out is there anything that you can glean from it and in terms of mass automation, you still need people to stand, stand that up. Now, is it uh, possible that, um, is it possible that it's, um, that you, there'll be less of it? It's possible, but I think that um, there's, there's gonna be so, the amount of data that's being, um, used uh, by companies is just exponential. And so you always need people to actually tap into that data. Um, let's see, another question, and I will just say that um, if you would like to, to ask your question after I finish these, the next two, please go ahead and, and ask, ask them directly. Um, the next question was, uh, do you use AWS services um, for your cloud needs at work, um, do you personally prefer AWS uh, for Azure over AWS? Um, really, um, I really don't have a preference. Um, RTS Labs takes the approach that we are, are, are cloud agnostic. We don't care if it's Google Cloud, Azure, or AWS. Um, what I will say um, about them is that um, Microsoft um, has a uh, has more experience with data, and so their products tend to be more um, focused on on making things a little bit easier for um, for users. Um, so, for example, I can tell you that the Azure Data Factory service is a very is a great service because it allows you to um, uh, patch together various services within the cloud in order to access data. And, and that um, interaction um, is a little bit more difficult on AWS. At the same time, what I will say, say for, AD, for AWS is that AWS definitely has, um, uh, has a, a better look and feel to it um, than Azure. Um, and it uh, it can satisfy different needs. So it it really so for me it really does it really doesn't doesn't matter. Um, and I, but I would say that if you um, want to start doing sort of some data engineering piece, um, uh, I would say that you can get exposure to both and and decide on yourself. Um, let's see. Um, so that was question two. And the next question, what are the differences between Apache Spark um, and Hadoop since they're both used for big data? Um, okay, so P Apache Spark is, is the latest and greatest framework 
Um, there's um, there's a big technical difference between uh, Hadoop and Spark. Um, Hadoop um, was basically the first um, uh, was the first uh, distributed computing um, framework that that came out um, in sort of uh, in the mid or sorry in the later um, later 2008 2010 um, and it's used it is used for big data but the problem is is that it's not um, it's not optimized for workflows. So you would have to build a Hadoop job to do one task, and then you would have to build a separate job to do another task and link the two together. With Apache Spark, it's, um, it, that framework allows you to basically pass data between tasks um, and in, in a single job and is a lot more performant. So Spark is Spark is is the better way to do it. Also, Spark um, has um, has you know compatible APIs with Python, Java, um, and native Scala to interact with. Uh, I believe Apache Hadoop uh, can only be written in Java, so that limits who can actually actually work on it, which just makes Spark uh, a superior um, uh, a superior framework um, in this modern era. All right, so can you explain data factory and Databricks a little bit more? Sure, so let me um, go back. I can definitely go back to the, that. So um, data factory um, in Azure, um, you can think of it as a data orchestration, as a main data orchestration tool. Um, if you actually uh, work with a data factory, what you'll see is that you're given the ability to not only process data, but you're also able to pass data um, from one service to another. Um, so technically, um, what I could do in, in data factory is I could say, I want to pull data um, from this internal database source, I want to store it in my in my data lake, and then after I push it into my data lake, I want to then run uh, this Azure Databrick job against the data that I just loaded into into uh, into storage. Um, and so it, it's mainly an orchestration tool, but it does have the ability to process data internally for you. Um, with its own sort of internal, what's called data workflow. So, um, so that's sort of like its main its main role. Um, Databricks is basically a platform for collaborative um, machine learning and data processing. It basically takes the form of managing your infrastructure um, for you. So, when you work with Spark or any of the big data um, big data tools, there's sort of two components. One is the infrastructure, where you have to say, I need, you know, a cluster of five, ser five servers, each with 20 gigs of RAM and eight CPUs, right? And you need, and in a typical workflow, you need to manage that cluster. You need to manage the resources there. And typically, you would want to spin them up, run the process, and spin them back down. Well, if in a in a normal workflow, that might be a, a lot of a lot of work. Azure Databricks, or rather, I should say Databricks, um, because they can Databricks can work on both AWS and Azure. Um, manages that component for you of managing the infrastructure, spinning up clusters, destroying clusters, and also running the code um, that you're building on the on the platform. Um, itself, um, either in Scala, Java, or again in Python. Um, so uh, that um, piece in Databricks is um, is really what what that is that is used for. Um, I can tell you that um, that one of the big issues um, in data engineering, if you're if uh, if you really get into it, is really the source of truth, because what 
um, you will find is that there are multiple places where data is stored and data flows through the pipeline, if you will. Um, and the question is, what is the source of the truth? So one of the things that you can see here, moving from the storage up into, in, up into the model and serve, um, is this thing called Polybase. Polybase was introduced by Microsoft, um, I think um, a, f a few years ago, that allows you to tap into a file system and actually view it within a database. So the really, really the question becomes, you know, is that the is that the raw data? Um, is that the source source of truth for the raw data, or are you tapping into Databricks and is that output the true raw data that you want to want to find? So what you'll find is that as you're going through as a data engineer, that there's multiple places where the data is stored at various stages, and one of the question comes up is like, what is the source of truth, um, and how do you interact with with that data. What I can also tell you about Databricks is that it has its own storage system where you bring raw data in, you can process it and store it in, um, in tables within the Databricks, Databricks service. And you can access that either through an API or through, through a reporting tool, which you can see here in number five from Databricks to Power BI. Power BI being a reporting tool, you can access it directly. Um, so that sort of administrative piece of, of how do you process and store the information um, is, really, is really critical. So if that gives you sort of an idea of both just data factory and data bricks, and also so, sort of the complications that come up, I hope that answers that sort of question. Um, so there's so I see there's no more questions like, on the open piece, but but I'm open to take any other questions. It looks like we actually had a question from a call-in listener who just messaged me since they're on the phone. This okay. question is: Are there concerns about security with going on the cloud, or is security not really different on the cloud from having your own servers? Um. So there so there is um security concerns. Um. Now, most cloud platforms have, uh, you know, various ways to ensure that the, that not only your data is secure, but access to the data um, is can be managed. So every cloud platform has something called um, like uh, I, IAMs or uh, identification uh, um, authorization management profiles. Um, which I, I think that's what it stands for. It, it could be something, a, a different acronym. But basically, they're profiles that um, allow administrators to grant access to various services or, ver or various, um, uh, uh, various services or various uh, data, um, data sources. Um, you, there's also, um, on these platforms, there's also a concept called um, a virtual private cloud, which is sort of a, a, a space that is solely used by, by a client where you can only have um, certain points of access. So typically when we are dealing, dealing, with, um, dealing with clients, what we do is we set up a, a private cloud and we typically say we can, you can only access the cloud if, you're, if you are on um, a VPN connection. Um, typically, for us, it would be the RTS VPN, um, and uh, or when you're located in the office, that's the only time you have access to. Um, in addition, um, you can also set up um, SSH um, access to to different services. So there's been several several times where we've uh, built. Um, at RTS applications for clients, where we put it, um, um, put a bastion um, service across it. And basically what that says is that if I want to access a database, I need to provide it an SSH key, as well as be on, on the correct network. So there's various ways that you can um, increase security. But as a baseline for most cloud providers, they do have the ability to Man, manage uh, those security um, those security points. Uh, 
Um, are there are there any other other questions, um, either data related, code related, um, anything like that? Looks like we're good with questions. If I could ask you one question from Code Code Labs, um, what inspires you about the world of tech today? What inspires me? Um, really, I think um, what makes my job uh, what makes it fun to do my job and what's really inspiring is that it's um, you have to be on your toes all the time. Um, you know, one of as one of the things that I said was that there's there's always this fight between open source um, technologies um, and proprietary technologies. Um, you know, there are there are people um, both on GitHub and other and other code repository platforms that are building, you know, amazing tools, amazing frameworks. Um, that they are just releasing to the general general public um, in order to, for them to use. And they could be uh, data related, they could be just a simple tool, um, but they are the cogs in the, in the data engineering machine that makes your life possible. Um, and so just the number of projects that are coming online, um, the, uh, the new technologies that are coming forward, um to make uh to sort of change the game um is is very uh is very exciting um and so that sort of um gives me inspiration to look for new ways of doing things for clients like one of the things that is coming uh, that is becoming more prevalent is a is a technique called extract load and transform and this is in reference to pulling information from a database or from a, a source, loading it directly into a, a, a warehouse, either in the cloud or, or on, on premise, and then doing your transformations and applying your business logic after the fact in order for, um, in order for it to be quicker for your end users. Um, and so it's only within the last five years that this sort of technique has been is become possible because what's really happening is that people are are um, like writing SQL queries with their business logic sort of built into it in order to make things faster. You know, ten years ago you couldn't do that because you were limited by the technology technology at the time. It wasn't performant to run massive queries within data warehouses would you, uh, at least transformations, you would want to write simple select, select from table. Um, nowadays, you can write, you know, you know, monstrous queries where you're doing all these transformations and the platforms are performant, you know, returning results in, in under five seconds, right? So that just pushes you as a data engineer to adopt new techniques and embrace um, new ways of doing things to give, um, you know, a competitive edge or just makes things more efficient. Awesome. Well, that looks like it's it for questions right now. If you'd like to um, start with the demo that you had planned, that would be awesome. Sure. So let me, um, let me switch my, um, let me switch my, um, So, um, so the demo that I'm going to show uh, quickly, because I, I see that we only have 10 minutes left. Um, uh, this uh, project or this um, uh, this platform is called Prefect. Um, it's a workflow um, engineering platform or workflow um, platform um, to help you build um, workflows from point A to point B. Um, and so what I'm going to show you is sort of like the, uh, is sort of the platform first to get you an, uh, sort of an idea of the things that are sort of important for data engineers. And then I'll actually show you the code that I wrote in Python to, to do it. Um, so this right here um, is sort of uh, is just the front page 
um, sort of gives me a summary of, you know, how many, how many workflows have run, were they successful, upcoming runs, failures, errors, that sort of thing. Um, I can then actually go look at my flow um, as, uh, um, and sort of get all of this great information. Right, I can see that you know I'm running this version of the workflow because, as as you may know, there's um, in encoding, knowing which version of your pack of your libraries is very important uh, to maintain maintain consistency. Um, Prefect is great um, in term in terms of um, letting you really write whatever you want in code, um, and and uh, process the information. Um, I can look um, at the tasks that I'm doing for this particular one, and I can also look at the schema um, in, ter in terms of what the workflow is going to be. So in this particular one, I have um, this function called add values, where I have three separate rounds, and then I'm doing multiplications on, I'm multipl multiplying the items. Um, and so, so what I can um, do, is I can just do a quick run and here you can just uh, you can see that it's um, going forward it's starting to execute and then it will like show me how how it's executing one by one um, and showing like okay it's added values all these activities are done it can tell me uh, you know how fast things are going you know from one one to another so you can see that it took you know five seconds to run this workflow um, and also provides logging and all of these are very important for a data engineer because you are not just working with one tool you know i could if i wanted to using prefect i could um, integrate with aws and run um, a lambda or a lambda command for a thousand a thousand iterations right and it's important for me to know you know what is happening in those thousands because if i have an error i have to know how, which which is breaking so logging is very important understanding your workflow is very important um, and then just having that visual concept of how things are flowing is also is also very important so i really like like prefect um, and actually what i'm going to show you um, now is actually the code behind it. Um, uh, sorry, too many. Um, oops. Too many, um, too many things open. There you go. So, um, so I've written this um, at least for Prefect. I, this is all writ written in Python. Um, I'm using uh, for those who want to know. I'm using Python three eight five, um, and um, Really, this is a the, this at least. Um, if you're interested, you can go to prefect.io um, in order to look at the library. But you can really um, build any sort of workflow that you want in here, because uh, at least from Prefect's point of view, you really don't. It really doesn't care what what it's doing. So in this case, you can see here that I'm I'm writing a, um, a workflow here where I'm passing it default values and I'm doing this loop for in a dictionary um, to sort of process the various tasks and then multiply them. Um, and then for myself, um, as, because I'm, I'm trying to be efficient, um, I writ, wrote um, also this code down here to make it um, efficient for me to actually build my workflow and also deploy my workflow to um, to the cloud if I want it to. Um, and that is something that I did. It, it's not built into the library, but because I'm writing everything in Python, 
it just allows I'm a, I'm able to actually make those modifications myself to make everything easier. Um, so I know that that was sort of a quick demo. And if you if anyone wants to have any other questions, um, even after this presentation, you could always uh, email me um, it, uh, at j dot ramirez at rtslabs.com. Um, and I think I saw. Um, so that's sort of my, my code um, presentation. If you have any questions about this platform or about the code, you, uh, I think we have about five more minutes, so I'm happy to answer any of those questions. Um, let's see, there's, um, let's see, um, is, is there any more questions? um for me i don't think so awesome well i thank you so much guys for your for your time um and i hope i gave you something to chew on about data engine data engineering um again if you have any questions uh just re reach out to me um and what I will do is I'll send some resources um, to Code Day, uh, to, to Cora, um, and uh, she can send it out to those who are interested in it. Of course, thank you so much. I'll make sure to post that for the attendees to see on our Discord and announcements. Um, I wanna thank John for doing this amazing talk, and I also wanna thank our attendees for asking all the questions. Have a wonderful afternoon, everybody. Bye. Bye.